Today's webinar will cover the TSI and TSI-2 and college readiness indicators. As most of you already know, the Texas Success Initiative Assessment is a series of placement tests for students enrolling in public colleges and university in Texas. The tests determine whether students are ready for college level coursework in the areas of reading, writing, and math. In this webinar, you will have an opportunity to learn from Keelan Morgan about the TSI and TSIA 2 uh, He'll be covering the test administration updates and implementations for K through 12 CCMR indicators. You'll also have an opportunity to participate in a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. So I know we have a lot of folks on the line who might be new to us, so I just wanted to take a brief moment to introduce Texas OnCourse. With Texas OnCourse, all Texas students, no matter where they come from or where they're headed, have a plan for success after high school, and that is our mission. Uh, we are a state-funded initiative designed to improve college and career advising and readiness across the state. Uh, Texas OnCourse is part of the Texas Higher Education College and Career Advising Department. We were created at the request of the Texas Legislator that works in partnership with the Governor's Tri-Agency Workforce Initiative. All of these organizations work together to connect education and industry in Texas. So the users of our tools include middle and high school counselors, teachers, administrators, and uh, community-based organizations that focus on post-secondary success. And we also provide a lot of different resources for our students and their families. So a few things, um, all of our webinars are recorded. Um, as you know, we've already started to record this meeting. Uh, the recording will be sent out to you and all of the registrants uh, after. So if you know a colleague that was not able to make it this morning, um, no worries. They will be receiving the recording as well. And we also have all of our upcoming and previous webinars posted to our webpage. Uh, so whenever you have a moment, feel free to browse some of those previous topics as well. That being said, in addition to finding our previous webinars on our webpage, you can also find them on our YouTube channel. So if you haven't already, uh, please feel free to subscribe to our, um, our YouTube channel for our most up-to-date information. So again, just welcome. We are so excited to have you this morning and spend this um, Tuesday with you. Uh, to give you just a quick overview of today's session, we will um, quickly introduce ourselves, give you a little background information on us um, that are presenting with you today, and then Ashley McKenzie will cover our resource spotlight, and then we'll move into Keelan, who will take us through the most recent TSI and TSI 2 updates. We will also have about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of this webinar for a Q&A session. So please add your questions to the Q&A box um, as we're going through that we will be able to address those at the end of the webinar. My name is Andrea Panter. I am the Senior Implementation Coordinator with Texas OnCourse. I started my education career a little over 15 years ago as a special education teacher in Houston, Texas. From there, I worked at a nonprofit in Austin, uh, Texas Austin Partners in Education as a curriculum specialist, as well as a math program manager. And now I have the privilege of working with um, Ashley and Keelan. Ashley. Hello, my name is Ashley McKeezy. Um, I started my journey in education in 2005 as a high school social studies teacher. I have also worked as a college admission counselor for the University of Texas at San Antonio, and I was a high school counselor for about six and a half years before joining Texas On Course. I am so excited to be here with you guys and share some of our great resources. Thank you, Ashley. Keelan? Good morning, everyone, and hopefully you can hear me just fine. Uh, Keelan Morgan, Assistant Director of College Readiness and Student Success here at the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Um, almost to my 20th year in higher education, started off with those wonderful TRIO programs 
in uh, outreach and success, and then transitioned on to the uh, inaugural director of student success initiatives in University College at Texas State University, which um, TSI was part of my portfolio and through that work, uh, and then subsequently my work with the coordinating board landed me in my current position, which I'll be celebrating five years in come February 1st. Awesome. Thank you for joining us today, Ashley and Keelan. Uh, we also have Trisha Euler behind the scenes inserting all of our different links and resources um, in the chat as well. Again, please add any of your questions to the Q&A box so we can get um, make, just make sure that we have those uh, to answer during our Q&A session. Um, so we're going to go ahead and switch over to Ashley and she will walk us through our Texas Encore Spotlight. So uh, many of you are probably already familiar with the Texas OnCourse Academy modules. These are free professional development opportunities that um, educators can access online. We use the Canvas learning platform. So if you are familiar with that from your school district, um, it's really easy to use. So this month we are featuring two of our Academy modules. One is designed specifically for K through 12 school counselors and it is titled Advising All Students to Be College Ready. Um, we have a companion module for that for any of you that are logged on that are our higher ed partners, and that is called Student Advising with College Readiness and Equity in Mind. Both of these modules feature information about the TSI, college readiness, as well as um, tips for helping to keep equity in mind when you are advising your students. Um, so in those, in those modules, you'll learn about college readiness standards and how to help your students meet them, how TSI status may impact their post-secondary enrollment, and ways that you can support them and additional accommodations that students may be eligible for. Both of these modules are currently under review, and you will see within the next month or so that they will have updated content. So please make sure that if you have already completed them, you log in and see the new content. You can go to the next slide. Um, additionally, in these modules, you will find helpful resources that you can download um, as PDFs and use when you're advising students. Um, one that I wanted to point out specifically is our college readiness vocabulary. As Keelan gets into his content today, um, you will notice that our definition of college readiness in K through 12 school counseling is a little different than college readiness on the higher ed side. And so that vocabulary document will help you understand the difference between higher ed college readiness and CCMR as many of our K-12 counselors know that function. Um, additionally, there's one more resource that I wanted to share with you and Trisha will share this link in the, um, in the chat. But on the next slide, you will see a link to a helpful document that TEA has created to help you beginning this year with accountability. Um, Keelan will go over the TSIA 2 and information about that. And we know as um, high school counselors that CCMR is really important. And now that it counts toward accountability, we wanna make sure that we know what our students need to do on that TSIA 2 test in order to earn their CCMR point. And so TEA has created this great chart to show you exactly what students need to meet and the standards that are expected for them. Um, so if you don't already have that, it's a good download as well. Those are our resources for this month. Thank you, Ashley. I will now transition into learning more about um, our TSI and TSA2 updates um, from Keelan Morgan. Thank you, Keelan. Good morning again, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. And I, in advance, I'm going to throw a lot of information at you in a very short period of time. In the chat, I've dropped my email address as well as um, it's included at the end of this presentation. So if you have any questions or comments regarding anything that's shared, uh, we will have time for Q&A, but if we don't have time to address it during the Q&A period, please feel free, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Next slide. This uh, simple slide will guide our 
time today. So we'll talk a little bit about the Texas Success Initiative. I'll go in depth a little bit more about some of the enhancements to the assessment. I'll share with you some data on um, regarding implementation and how students are doing. And then we'll wrap up with college readiness best practices. So when we talk about college readiness here at the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, we're simply talking about the Texas Success Initiative. Most familiar, you're with the assessment, that's the TSIA. And the assessment um, is required by the TSI and it's required to uh, assess students to determine their readiness to enroll in freshman level cor um, coursework. So it has two components in terms of the TSI statute. And I just talked about the assessment. And then there's also the advisement or plan for academic success. And that's for high school complete students that are using the TSI for placement. And I'd like to pause just to contextualize uh, a lot of uh, information surrounding the Texas Success Initiative assessment, particularly uh, the former version and the current version. It's primarily designed for high school complete students. So the primary audience for the TSI is high school complete students, but we're very much aware that it is a low hanging fruit for students to qualify for uh, dual credit and it uh, back ends into, <clears throat> excuse me, the outcomes based funding uh, protocols for House Bill 3. And then just one more note on the TSI that an institution may not use the TSI as a condition of admission to the institution or as a condition of admission to a specific program offered by the institution. If you have any concerns as you're working with students in the space of uh, college access that uh, inadvertently an institution is using the TSI to do that, please do not hesitate to reach out to me so we can uh, clarify that with the institution. Next slide. So when we talk about college readiness, uh, what does this look like? So here in fall 2020, and then I'll share with you some data uh, for fall 21 shortly, but 56% of first time in college students enter college ready. Uh, what does that mean? That they entered uh, without the need for developmental education. So statewide in fall 2020, you see that roughly 56% of our students entered college ready and 37% entered not college ready. However, when it splits out into the pie charts, uh, respectively on the left and the right, you see that our community and technical colleges or our two-year colleges have a heavy lift in this work of working with students who come in underprepared in one or more areas. And those areas are uh, reading, writing, and or math. And then our four-year institutions, uh, about 15% are coming in uh, underprepared in one or more areas. And that's simply um, explained by the admission criteria for those institutions, which mostly align with uh, college readiness criteria with the TSIA. Next slide. So in fall 2021, uh, if I were doing this live and you were sitting before me, I would ask you to pay attention to the previous slide and then show this slide and then go back. And so you can see the trend, but you can see that uh, unfortunately we're not going in the direction that we would like to that in fall 2021, whereas fall 2020, it was 56% of students entering college ready In fall 2021, it uh, came down to 50%, a six percentage point loss statewide. And again, those margins for students coming in, not college ready in one or more areas grew with respect to two year and four year college. So you can see that uh, just across the board that we have a lot of work to do. Next slide. And when we break this out by subject area, um, I know many of you, your hamster wheels are probably running. It's like, oh, well, it's reading, writing and math. Well, the TSI two, uh, only has um, two subject areas, English language arts and reading and math, which I'll talk about later. But for reporting purposes, so we can keep that uh, longitudinal data, we'll always have it broken out by reading, writing and math. So you'll see that again, uh, based on what I shared with you in the pie charts by subject area, we did see a decline in all areas from uh, fall 20 to fall 2021. And that's really indicative of the learning loss that we've been seeing that's aligned with a lot of the information that the um, TEA commissioner, Mike Morath has been reporting with regard to the pandemic. So hopefully we'll start to see a uh, recovery with that very soon. But those numbers are there for your review. Next slide. 
So how can a student demonstrate college readiness? Of course, we have the Texas Assess Initiative Assessment, uh, the former version and the current version. And when I say the former version, I'm really referring to the scores. The former version is no longer available, the assessment itself. However, uh, TSIA and TSIA2 scores are uh, good from five years from date of testing. We have uh, ACT and SAT benchmarks, and then the STAR EOC, English 3 and Algebra 2. And in advance, I know you're thinking, oh, well, we don't offer those tests uh, in our district. And then subsequently, TEA has uh, removed those not only from being offered, from, uh, from, allowed, from being able to be offered. So with that, uh, those, there, are, there is content from the English 3 and Algebra 2 TEKS in the TSIA uh, too. So for now, that uh, that will stand. But um, who's to say we might be revisiting that uh, down the road? The college prep course, if a student completes the college prep course, the student can demonstrate college readiness. And then, of course, earn college credit in reading, writing, or math intensive. And that's determine on how the institution codifies that credit on the student's transcript. So if it's accepted as an elective credit, unfortunately, it would not be in place of a TSI liable course. However, if that reading, writing, or math intensive course is aligned and accepted in place of one of their TSI liable courses, the student, uh, if that would be a demonstration of college readiness. And then again, for the full list of um, exemptions, exceptions, and waivers, uh, please visit to Texas Administrative Code Rule 4.54. Next slide. Note that the THECB definition of college readiness differs from dual credit eligibility, which is governed by Texas Administrative Code Rule 4.85. The TEA definition of college readiness, uh, post-secondary college and career military readiness, uh, more affectionately known as CCMR, and then multiple measures assessment placement protocols, which uh, you became familiar with um, during the pandemic with the TSI COVID waiver. Next. And speaking of the TSI COVID waiver, the TSI COVID waiver can no longer be used for placement. Summer 22 was the last semester the waiver could be used for placement. And in advance, I'm already aware there are some institutions for some odd reason that did not get this memo and proceeded uh, to um, the fall semester and then subsequent semesters using the TSI COVID waiver, but we are working to um, correct that. And then just note that fall 22 and beyond placements must use THCB rules. And then uh, that's 4.51 through 4.63 4 for TSI and 4.85 for dual credit. Next slide. And just to give you uh, a little bit of insight to uh, what we're doing with multiple measures beyond uh, summer 22. So in rule for high school complete students, institutions must use the TSI assessment along with other holistic factors in their consideration of the developmental, developmental education courses or interventions that the student uh, may be required to engage in if they do not meet the TSI benchmark. So already in rule for high school complete students, institutions have the ability to use multiple measures assessment placement. It's just not in the same 100% um, purview of the TSI COVID waiver where you could enroll the student in the college level course without required support. So under this particular provision uh, for developmental education, using other holistic factors, it may be the determination of whether a student is placed in a three-hour developmental education course uh, juxtaposed of a non-course-based option where that may last two to three weeks. And then uh, more information on this can be found in Texas Administrative Code uh, 4.57. Next slide. And with regard, we hear you loud and clear. Uh, we've not turned our, uh, to made a hard left turn completely away from multiple measures of assessment. We're currently engaged in a study with the Center for Analysis of Post-Secondary Readiness to explore the impact and outcomes related to the TSI COVID waiver. So we're really looking at uh, what are those factors that uh, have the greatest utility in determining whether or not students would be successful in college, first college level courses. So we've convened a group of seven, what we refer to as data colleges to participate in this project. Uh, working with these colleges, we've paired back the indicators that can be used to high school GPA, 
in course taking pattern. Uh, so for course taking pattern, an example is four years of English, four years of math. And again, that's uh, to place underprepared students in college level courses without required support. And then based on those protocols, we're looking at their success in their first college level course to determine how high school GPA and uh, course taking patterns uh, predict those and the effect of those predictions. So we're fully engaged in that to fall through fall of 2024. And findings from this study may be used to inform potential statewide policy related to TSI and placement protocols. Next. Here's information that's uh, hot off the press. Um, subsequent to our upcoming board meeting this month, this uh, provided the board approves it, this may go into effect. So currently, as you're aware, the ACT benchmark for the TSIE for, to, for a student to be exempt, the student must have a composite score of 23 to start with to even be considered and then respectively a 19 in each subject area on the English test or the mathematics test. So we're actually uh, have a proposal that has went through uh, the uh, open comment period through the Texas Register, and now it's uh, be presented to our board for enactment uh, later this month. And that change is on the next slide. Where again, just to highlight proposed, we're using the, um, we're using the composite score of 23 as the base. So if they have the composite score of 23, you pass go, you can be considered uh, if you have a 19 on the English test or math test. We're moving in the direction to align uh, better with the, with the vendors college readiness benchmarks. So it reads ACT administered on or after February 15, 2023 a combined score of 40 on the English and reading test shall be exempt for both the reading and writing or ELAR sections of the TSI assessment. Let me unpack that real quick before I go on to math. So previously, it was a 23 composite and a 19 on the English test to be exempt from reading and writing. The proposed is a combined score of 40 on the English and reading test. So we're uh, now incorporating the reading test uh, into this. And you might want to ask why we're doing this. The overall composite score actually brought in, the overall composite score actually brought in um, considerations of scores from other areas outside of those that uh, were just impacting the uh, English and reading area. So in concert with conversations with uh, ACT, we found it best that we now align with the English and reading score. And then a combination of those scores of 40 would exempt the student from uh, both reading and writing on the TSI assessment. So again, that doesn't have to be a 20 and 20. It could be a 19 and 21. It could be a 39 and one. And yes, I'm making that trivial. I don't, I don't think we'll have any situations like that. But I just want to show you that um, the spread of uh, scores could vary to where we didn't want to uh, penalize the student. Oh, well, you did really well in English, but not reading. So based on the combination of those scores, that student can earn an exemption. And for math, we again, no longer using the composite score, but a score of 22 on the mathematics test shall be exempt for the mathematics section of the TSI assessment. And again, there is no composite score. And the math score, again, formally, it was a 23 composite and a 19 on the mathematics test. However, uh, in, in accordance with uh, the college readiness benchmark set by ACT for the mathematics test uh, of 22, we are using that benchmark. Uh, further, the use of scores from both ACT administered prior to February 15, 2023 and the ACT administered after February 15, 2023 is allowable as long as the benchmark set forth in the clause of this paragraph are met. So I'll start with math because that's the easiest. So let's just say um, for some odd reason, a student did not meet a composite score of 23, but they had a mathematics test, a previous math um, Maddox test score of uh, 22, that student would then be um, exempt. And then for, for ELAR, 
regarding the uh, test administration, uh, previous score could be combined um, with a subsequent test if the student uh, retests. And we'll be sharing more information on this subsequent to the board decision uh, later this month. Next slide. College prep course reminders. This has uh, uh, more and more been a topic that has been brought to our attention. So I just wanted to really take some time to highlight uh, some of the idiosyncrasies regarding the college prep course and specifically the uh, Texas Success Initiative exemption. So the TSI exemption. So it reads in rule that a student who successfully completes a college prep course under Texas Education Code 28.014 is exempt for a period of 24 months from the date of high school graduation with respect to the content area of the course. And you'll see on this slide I have from the date of high school graduation underlined. I'm highlighting that because uh, within uh, TEH protocols, there's really no um, structure in terms of who can or who cannot take the course, although the in 28. Uh, 014, it is, it does say that the college prep course is designed for a student at the 12th grade level. And that can mean a variety of things. We know that a number of students are coming into high school, uh, already have completed algebra one, and they may be taking geometry or algebra two. So technically, when they're getting to that um, uh, fourth high school credit, it could be their junior year. However, for the purpose of a TSI exemption, it, with, without regard to when a student completes the college prep course, they cannot use it for a TSI exemption until the date of high school graduation, which means that it can't be used for the purpose of dual credit. And I kind of skipped to the last bullet on the slide, but that's a common question we get as well. Well, we're going to enroll the student in the college prep course and then subsequent to completion, they can uh, qualify for dual credit. The college prep course is not listed as a way that a student can qualify for dual credit in uh, Texas Administrative Code 4.85. Students participating in the Texas College Bridge must successfully complete the course prior. And you see I have there uh, kind of standing on my chair. If you can see my video, I'm kind of animated with my hands prior to high school graduation date for the TSI exemption. And this back ends into the underlying text from the rule that I just shared that it's from the date of high school graduation. So if that student has not successfully completed the Texas College Bridge, which is a type of college prep course uh, prior to high school graduation, that student cannot use that completion for um, the purpose of a TSI exemption. And institutions of higher education are aware that the certificate of completion that the student receives uh, through their uh, green locker from Texas College Bridge, the date must precede the date of their high school graduation or at least be on that date. So again, uh, those are some highlights from the college prep course. And if you definitely need me to unpack any of that uh, uh, more deeply, say we'll have time in Q&A and then always feel free to email me. Next. Next. So just a, a reminder, the TSI 2 pre-assessment activity, uh, we did switch vendors as of March 1st, 2022. We uh, no longer use Querium. We're now with the College Board. So it's now integrated um, seamlessly into the TSI 2 platform for reporting. And through the practice app, students can access the pre TSI 2 pre-assessment activity. So again, it's required prior to the initial administration of the TSI assessment. So in the case of a retest, uh, we leave that to local decision uh, if you'll require the student to retake the uh, PAA. However, prior to the first time a student takes it, you're required to administer the pre-assessment activity. Uh, just a reminder, you may use the say supported uh, PAA, which is the one that we provide now through the College Board, or an institution may create their own, but it must meet the criteria outlined in uh, Texas Administrative Code Rule 4.55B. And last but not least, regarding the uh, state-supported or the College Board's uh, pre-assessment activity, through custom reporting in the TSI, plat 
TSIA2 platform, you can access uh, a list of students who've completed the PAA and designated uh, your district or the or your institution as we refer to you as. And if you have any questions about uh, the reporting, please reach out to me and I can put you in contact with our college board liaison who's put together some uh, pretty streamlined trainings regarding this. Next slide. If you're not fully, if you're new to the space and you're wondering, okay, what is the big deal? He keeps mentioning the TSIA, the TSIA2, what's the difference? So the TSIA2 launched January 11th, 2021, and we made some major enhancements. We integrated reading and writing into one test. Formerly, they were two separate tests. There were three subject areas, reading, writing, and math. Now there are only two, English language arts and reading, which is the integrated reading and writing test, inclusive of the essay. <clears throat> and then the mathematics section. We reduced the diagnostic test to one per subject area. We created a second chance pass opportunity for math through the diagnostic test. So as you're administering uh, the TSIA2, um, I know it's in our best interest to give students as much information. Hey, you'll take uh, a set of 20 questions and depending how you do on those, you may receive additional questions. Please encourage students to continue to do their best on the diagnostic test because they still have a pathway to college readiness. And this is new for math and it still exists for uh, English language arts and reading. Students may send their scores directly to institutions at time of testing and through the student portal. So uh, regarding this, please use this responsibly, I always say. Um, so if you're testing your early college high school students, uh, you may only want to have them submitted to the dual credit partner that you'll be working with juxtapose of, hey, I want to go to UT or I want to go to a and uh, If that's not your dual credit partner, because it just really, it creates uh, more data for them to uh, have to hold on to. But at any point, a student can go back into the student portal beyond the time of testing and resend those scores directly to an institution or pull them down directly for their use as well. Next slide. Just a recap of the college readiness benchmarks for English language arts and reading. And you'll see that I have a, a legend at the bottom of this slide where CRC refers to the college readiness classification test. That's that first set of 20 questions. And then the um, diagnostic level that's uh, resulting from the diagnostic test, which is the uh, expanded uh, set of questions if a student doesn't meet the college readiness benchmark on the CRC. So recapping the benchmarks for English language arts and reading, a CRC score greater than or equal to 945 and an essay score greater than or equal to five. Or a CRC score that did not meet the 945 is less than 945 and a diagnostic level that's greater than or equal to five and an essay that's greater than or equal to five. And you'll see that uh, with that second one, I have an asterisk by the five and that's referencing the essay range. The actual essay range is one, two, eight. So a score of zero indicates that the score was not able to be evaluated and cannot be used for the purpose of placement and a student is required to retest on the essay only. I highlight that, but that's more, that's more uh, applicable to institutions of higher education because for the purpose of dual credit, if you do not meet the benchmark, i.e. Uh, demonstrate college readiness, you would not be able to use your TSI score uh, for that purpose. And for mathematics, a college readiness classification score greater than or equal to 950, and for students that do not meet the 950, they again, they can fight back through that to a, a path of college readiness through the diagnostic test. So if their CRC score is less than 950, they would need a diagnostic score um, equal to six. And in advance, no, we just did not pick the highest level for the, diag uh, diagnostic, for the diagnostic test. It's psychometrically aligned to the 950. So, uh, the diagnostic level of six is a true indicator of college readiness, and it would um, serve the same purpose as if the student met the uh, CRC of 950 or higher. Next slide. Here's some implementation updates, and I know everybody always wants to know, uh, are you watching these outcomes? Um, 
uh, pending what the data looks like on your campus. Hey, our students aren't passing at high rates. But overall, uh, an overview of outcomes, and this is from implementation through September of, 2020, September of 2022. We regularly meet with the test vendor, the college board, uh, and receive quarterly reports uh, regarding student outcomes. So thus far, over 825,000 English language arts and reading and 850,000 math administrations have taken place. For English language arts and reading, and this is a combined, like when we're looking at uh, both test takers under uh, institution of higher ed accounts and uh, high school accounts. So for English language arts and reading, approximately 16% of students are testing college ready. And we are noticing that the outcome, the essay outcome suggests uh, the learning loss. And that's particularly among the high school test takers. Uh, with math, approximately 20% are testing college ready. And we're noticing that a higher number of students are assessing at diagnostic level four. And just as I opened with on this slide, we continue to monitor closely these outcomes with the college board. And we're, in, we're dead smack in the middle of our validity study. And we anticipate those results in uh, fall of 2023. And in advance, uh, what, what happens with the validity study? So the validity study uh, looks at all the TSIA scores. We pull in uh, those students that took the test and their success rates in their first college level courses, and then look at the scores in tandem to, okay, is that 950 that's set for math the uh, best indication of uh, the best predictor of success for students in that first college level course? And if indeed um, any changes to the benchmarks will happen, they will be a result of the results of the validity study. Next slide. So here's a little bit of a different breakdown for that data. So now this is a comparison of the college readiness outcomes for ELAR and uh, for the IHE accounts and the high school accounts. In advance, let me, let me contextualize these data. These are not individual students. They're test administrations. So let's just say, um, Keelan took the TSIA two, and he took it five times uh, before he subsequently passed it. Keelan would be represented five times in these data. So no matter how many times I say that, I'm going to get an email from uh, a district official or from uh, some power that be that says students um, are doing that. But what we don't know is how many retests are a uh, part of this. But I can tell you that you'll see um, that the high school test administrations are almost double, like they're vastly higher than those four IHEs. And that's because the tradition, like really the, the use of the test is different. So for institutions of higher education, it's for placement. For high schools, it's primarily for um, uh, students qualifying for dual credit and also uh, being used as uh, an indicator of college readiness for uh, CCMR. So getting to the data at hand, you'll see for institutions of higher education that there are roughly uh, 277,000 or almost 278,000 uh, ELAR uh, test administrations and those under high school accounts are 547,000. So vastly different in number. And you'll see that the percentages in terms of college ready versus uh, not college ready that there's a significant difference in that is seven percentage, uh, roughly seven, seven or so percentage points. But I don't want to uh, highlight that in the uh, sense of, oh, um, just dichotomizing those two, but just to let you see that uh, how students and testing under high school accounts are doing. And then just FYI, about when I say testing under the account, it may not be one-to-one -one that every student that tests under an uh, institution of higher, higher education account is a college level or a traditional college student or students testing under high school accounts are traditional high school students. And that being with the uh, idiosyncrasy that for institutions of higher education, we still have some colleges and universities that are serving as the test administrators for their dual credit uh, districts, whereas they're testing students under their accounts. So then high school students would be represented under that number. And then for high schools, there are a number of high schools across the state that have adult education and literacy programs, which um, also uh, those, adult, those adult 
adult learners may be testing under the high school account. So again, it's not one-to-one. So that's where I'm, I'm, I choose words very carefully when I'm explaining these slides that one, it's test administration, and then uh, it's test administrations under those accounts because it's a little known fact, but the data for um, IEG accounts and high school accounts are in separate databases. So it's not just naturally combined. So that's why uh, one of the reasons we separated out like that as well. Next slide. For math, it's a little less uh, tumultuous in terms of uh, the percentage of college readiness. You'll see that 21.17, 0.17% were college ready for mathematics and 19.06 for uh, high school testing accounts. And again, you'll see the vast difference in test administrations uh, under these accounts as well. And I was trying to think there was one more point I wanted to make with math and it just escaped me, but I'll come back to it if I remember it. Next slide. Here's something that we've put in print. So you're, this is fresh off the press. So we've just solidified our official, official, official TSI2 calculator use policy. Uh, many of you, if you're familiar with the uh, technical assistance manual or the testing manual for the TSI2, it mirrors the active placer. However, Understand for the TSIA2, it is a computer adaptive test, and uh, each map question is predetermined uh, to what type, if any, calculator would be available. So for the online version, for the computer adaptive version, calculators of any kind are not allowed for the online computer adaptive version. The only calculators that are allowed are the on-screen calculators that are provided as applicable per math question. And we've went through grave lengths to try and um, um, create the tutorial for the calculator. So through the student portal, the student, we actually had it broken out to where now the student can go in and in the actual test environment, play around with the math uh, sample questions. And in the top right corner, they'll be able to see what type of calculator is available to them. And it'll be either a basic four function calculator, a basic four function calculator with the square root option, or um, a graphing calculator are the options that the student will be given uh, per uh, question. And if it indeed it is the graphing calculator that's provided to the student, they would also have the access to the other two calculators that I mentioned as well. So again, look at that as a hierarchy. If it requires the um, basic four function or if it's programmed, then it's like, oh, only the basic four, only the basic calculator with the square root function is allowed, they would still also have the uh, use of the basic four function calculator. So moving forward to the accommodated versions, and we receive a lot of questions regarding this, a lot of questions regarding this. One, are calculators allowed on the accommodated versions? And the answer is yes, but it's only a basic four function calculator with the square root feature that can be used. Uh, and it's important to note that there are no questions on the accommodated versions that warrant the use of a graphing calculator. And this ha we have verified this with our test vendor, which informed this policy just to make it very clean across the board. Because otherwise, if students were allowed to use graphing calculators, the test administrator would then be responsible for wiping the graphing calculator clean and making sure that any um, stored data was erased uh, in line with uh, policies such as that for SAT and ACT. So you couldn't be able to store uh, formulas or things like that in your calculator. So to keep it simple for the accommodated paper pencil version, uh, only the basic four function calculator with the square root feature can be used. So a little bit more on this. One of the things that we often get is, okay, there is no official qualification process for a student to qualify for the accommodated version, but we recommend that it's used as a last, <clears throat> excuse me, as a last resort. And the rationale is the accommodated version requires the students to do two and a half times questions, two and a half times, almost two and a half times more questions than on the uh, computer adaptive version. And again, more often than not, with regarding the uh, calculator policy, it's about a student's comfort level. And with that, we, again, in the uh, PAA as well, and I like that, I just kind of glanced over at the chat and saw 
that with the uh, sample questions on the PAA that uh, the student can engage with the calculator feature, but more specifically with the tutorial um, to get their comfort level to where they can engage with that on-screen calculator in a um, comfortable manner without, uh, by proxy of just wanting to use a handheld calculator, having to, again, undergo um, the additional questions that are required to um, make sure that the appropriate constructs are measured for the accommodated version. Next slide. You, if you are a uh, TSI2 test administrator, a proctor, a uh, score reporter, we've sent out a blast email that effective January 3rd, 2023, that we were amending the English language arts and reading branching profile to allow students at diagnostic level three to now receive the right place or essay. This um, was for a variety of reasons, but uh, just note that this change does not create an additional path for the student to demonstrate college readiness, but it does increase, uh, particularly for those high school complete students, uh, the amount of actionable data that institutions have in determining the appropriate developmental education uh, intervention, whether that's a DE course or NCBO as regards to placement. But as it regards to high school students, it will provide many additional students with the opportunity to demonstrate writing proficiency at that time and the potential to qualify for the standalone uh, English language arts um, CRC retest option. So let's just say a student uh, receives a diagnostic score of three, they'll now be given the right placer. If a student uh, does gangbusters on that right placer and they make that uh, passing score of five, that student it would still have to retake the ELAR CRC, but they would not have, re have to retake the essay. And I will be updating the, um, the ELAR retest options to reflect this. That's on the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board's website. And there's no changes on behalf of um, your districts. This was a global change to the branching profiles. So uh, College Board handled this for us. So um, if you've already experienced it, this is the rationale. And if you've not experienced it, um, hey, welcome to the party. Next slide. And as I wrap up, just some TSI2 important reminders. The TSI2 test administrators must adhere to all applicable policies and procedures related to administering a test. Uh, failure to do so may result in the loss of uh, access to administer the TSIA. Here's some common issues that I see. Administration of the, uh, the pre-assessment activity prior to testing, that that's not being done. Modifying the branching profiles. Uh, under no circumstance should uh, you be modifying the branching profiles. And we're like, even to add background questions for uh, K-12, we really want it to be the bare bones to where we don't have any misadministrations of, or inappropriate administrations of the TSIA2, because unfortunately students get caught in a branching, students get caught in a crosshairs. And when we say modifying the branching profiles, um, it also goes into, oh, the misunderstanding of the retest options where modifying the branching profiles, oh, well, we're gonna just split the uh, ELAR, CRC, and the SA, and we're going to administer those on different days. So we're going to create our own branching profiles, but we're not using the retest prof profiles to split it, but we're going to use our own branching. You cannot do that, and you cannot administer the retest profiles uh, separately to reduce the amount of time that it takes a student to take the test or anything like that. The big issue is when this happens, and I get, um, I, get, I get inquiries from institutions all the time regarding score reports. Um, it says they took the retest option and we can't validate that they've previously taken the TSIA to ELAR section or that they qualified for that ELAR retest option. What happens is the institutions cannot accept those scores because they're not aligned with the proper administration of the TSIA two, And sadly, Sometimes I have to be the bearer of bad news uh, inadvertently to an institution which has to relate it to a student that the scores that they have, which were technically passing, cannot be accepted because they were not administered with the guidelines of the TSIA2. And that's beyond the student's fault. So 
the onus is on you as uh, test administrators to ensure that you're administering the TSI-2 with in, in alignment with all applicable protocols. And when I say the misunderstanding of the ELAR retesting options, um, we commonly would get, like for students that did score a diagnostic level three, uh, previously they were not routed to the essay. And then um, the test administrator would be, oh, well, I guess the test made a mistake and go administer the essay only. And then if the student passed the essay, uh, made that score five or higher, they still didn't have an ELAR CRC score high enough to warrant them getting the essay. So again, the institution that the student sought to take dual credit at or enroll in would not be able to use those scores for uh, any purpose. So again, I cannot stress to you enough um, the importance of administering the TSI-2 in line with all applicable uh, protocols. And if you have any questions, no matter how big or small related to this or any other matter, definitely please email me because um, when the test administrator does not get it right, unfortunately, students bear the consequence and we do not want that. Next slide. Here's a unique opportunity. Uh, in conjunction with our uh, test vendor, the College Board, we're hosting a TSI2 Partners and Success Conference. It'll take place at the uh, ESC uh, 11 in uh, the Dallas area on May 4th and 5th. So you can visit the Texas, um, the TSI2 platform. So if you have access to that, we've sent out a call for proposals as well regarding this. So if your uh, proposal is accepted, uh, I believe the deadline for proposals is to January 17th. And we're looking for proposals on uh, best practices for administering the TSI-2 within the K-12 uh, context, uh, your dual credit partnerships in terms of how you're administering the TSI-2. Um, if you have any best practices for how you're uh, using the TSI-2 in the space of uh, meeting CCMR, please feel free. We want to bring together partners from both higher ed and K-12 to have the conversation uh, again as we're partners in success for the TSI-2. Again, it's May 4th and 5th, 2023, and the times are there. And we're having a, what is it? We're having a post-conference uh, specific training tracks for new and advanced users. So if you want additional training on the TSIE2, excuse me, the platform, um, please definitely attend this uh, workshop. Attendance will be capped at 250. So you wanna register early. The cost is $100 per meal. Your meals are included and we'll be sending out registration information in February. And if you have not received or were not aware of the opportunity to present and you would like to, please do not hesitate to email me and I'll ensure that you, I'll be sure that you get that information. Next slide. Next slide. And this is the end. So I just wanna leave you with a few college readiness best practices. And this is what we also share with our institutions of higher education in regards to what we share with you. And then we have college readiness best practices that we share with them. We want you to equitably consider students for opportunities that may result in demonstration of college readiness, uh, dual credit opportunities, um, inclusive of on-ramps, SAT, ACT, school day testing, AP courses, Assess students for college readiness and administer the TSI-2 early. And we're talking uh, spring semester, junior year. And in most cases, uh, students that are uh, seeking to qualify for dual credit may have already taken it. But for those students that uh, may not be in that dual credit pipeline, please test them as early as possible. Enroll students in the Texas College Prep course. I gave you a lot regarding um, the College Prep course reminders. And I spoke a little bit about Texas College Bridge, but particularly related uh, to the College Prep course, to the best of your ability, enroll them in the fall semester to ensure that they have the opportunity to complete this course by the complete the course by the time of high school graduation to qualify for the TSI CPC exemption. And the course may be considered for their advanced high school English or math credit. And then just as a last reminder, the CPC course cannot be used for the purpose of 
dual credit eligibility. So with that, I yield the floor, I believe, to questions. Next slide. Oh, and you got the resource slide, and I believe we can uh, stay there for um, a minute if people wanted to snapshot that. And I believe this presentation will be sent out to you as well. Yes, yeah, so we'll be sending out all of this slide, all the slide deck as well as the recording and all of the resources will be sent out afterwards. Awesome. And Andrew, I believe we're back in your hands for question and answer. Almost. Okay. <laughs> oh, and this slide, if you would like uh, updates on like the TSIA, uh, the TSI, uh, developmental education, and in advance, we do not send out a lot of updates. It's probably, I would say, because I actually have to type up those uh, updates, and it probably comes out maybe a max of three to five a quarter. So definitely, if you would like to uh, subscribe to our TSIDE listserv, you can scan the QR code or uh, click on that hyperlink once you receive the presentation. And I believe the next slide is my contact information. Yes. Are we there yet? <laughs> yes, we are. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Keelan. Yeah, so all of your contact information is here. You guys need to reach out to him for anything or any of us. And then we will jump into our Q&As. We have a lot um, in our Q&A bucket. So if you haven't had a chance to put any of those questions in there, feel free to go ahead and add them and we will kick it off with the first ones that I received. So um, Jamie Garza asks, what effect might the pandemic have had on the college readiness success percentages, not only preparation for, but also taking of exams? Interesting effect, great question. Um, so what we saw originally with the pandemic, it was self-selection. So when we enacted the uh, TSI COVID waiver, only those students that were going through Gravelands to take the TSI were taking it. We offered the virtual options, but at the same time for, it wasn't in the same vein of bring everybody to the, um, bring everybody to the computer lab and uh, take the test. It was more so seemingly reserved for those students that were seeking to qualify for dual credit. And uh, I don't want to uh, say the higher performing students, but those students with a little bit more grit that went through that extra, uh, those extra steps to actually take the test. And with that, it was actually the opposite effect. So we saw uh, traditionally higher scores because that self-selection, uh, that self-selection were for those uh, seemingly more motivated students. And we saw uh, higher scores during that time. But now that we're kind of leveling out to uh, pre-pandemic levels of testing, we're starting to see that the um, percentages of students testing at the college ready level are uh, still somewhat in line with those of the uh, its predecessor, the TSIA, as well. Thank you. And then our next question, and Jamie, if that doesn't answer it, you can always follow up with us as well. And just so you guys all know, we are going to stay on here for another 15 minutes. So any other questions that you want to add to the Q&A, feel free to do that. We have quite a few, so we're going to try and go through those. But also rest assured, if we don't get through all of them during this session, we will uh, reach out to you afterwards. So we had one from Zachary, which seven institutions are persistent? participating in the MMA study? My mindset is very much um, TSI and K-12 context right now, and I do not want to tell you a story. Please shoot me a direct email and I can get you that information. Okay, great. I and know then... four off the top of my head, but I know I can't complete the list. <laughs> All right, thank you, Keelan. And so um, from from. Marissa, what is the best practice to use the college prep as the waiver? What should a student submit to a post-secondary school to utilize the college prep waiver? So with the college prep course, it's a little tricky because first in the traditional sense in 28.014, the uh, college prep course is designed in local partnership between the ISD and the IHE through uh, a memorandum of understanding. So with that, it's only local to the institution in which uh, the ISD has the MOU. 
However, it gets a little bit uh, broader when you talk about Texas College Bridge. Texas College Bridge has created, and I'll use uh, this word loosely, kind of like a network of colleges that have brought into uh, this particular CPC that have agreed to uh, accept each other's college prep course by proxy of being uh, a user of Texas College Bridge. So for the traditional sense with the MOU and between the IHE and the ISD and just kind of like outside, and I'm speaking outside of Texas College Bridge specifically uh, on purpose. So I'll contextualize it like this. It's transcripted. So the, um, the college, the college prep course completion is transcripted on the student's high school transcript. And once that student goes to the institution, they need to inform their college advisor or their, uh, the person that they're working with for their uh, intake, if they're being requested for TSI information. Um, if that is indeed the partner that the ISD had the uh, MOU with for their traditional college prep course. In the case of Texas College Bridge, it is my understanding that through um, their green light locker that they receive a certificate and that certificate can be presented to the institution. But again, only the institutions that are actually participating with Texas College Bridge can accept that. Thank you. And then we have a question from Giovanna. Um, could college prep meet TSA requirements for dual enrollment programs like on ramps? No, I addressed that in my, um, I addressed that in the presentation that the college prep course is not codified as a um, qualification for dual credit in Texas Administrative Code Rule 4.85. The college prep course cannot be used for the purpose of students qualifying for dual credit. Thank you for clarifying that. And then from Lindsay, we have students send their scores to colleges through the portal, but then are told colleges don't have them. Where did the scores go at the colleges? Great question. And I did not delve into that. That's kind of getting into the weeds uh, in the presentation. But unfortunately, all institutions do not accept uh, scores via that electronic feature of the uh, portal. It's a process that they have to opt into and create infrastructure for. So always, although that feature is available, have your student contact the institution or make sure you're aware of how that institution prefers to accept those scores. But you are correct, not all, inst not all institutions um, will participate in the uh, online, online score share feature for the TSIET portal. Thank you. And then from Giovanna, um, I've experienced some issues with the pre-assessment activity next button not working on occasion. Students have had to completely start over for it to work. How can I report technical issues? You can report technical issues directly to the uh, College Board Help Desk. And if you just search, search College Board Help Desk, um, it's a general uh, email you can submit to. Or feel free, if you're experiencing that, um, let me know. And I can uh, definitely put that on the radar of our liaison at the College Board to ensure that it's being uh, addressed appropriately. But that's not the first time we've heard that. Oh, great. And then from Joseph, we have what grade level students were part of the validity study? So for the validity study, we're looking at high school complete uh, students. We're looking at uh, traditional college students that took the TSI and uh, their success in first college level courses. So I think what we're getting at are dual credit students included in the validity study. The answer is no. Right. And then from Giovanna, uh, what content is tested on questions without calculators? Feel free. The um, what are they? What are they? What are they? I'm trying to think of the appropriate name of the document. The they're on our college. They're on our higher education coordinating board website. It's almost like the technical assistance, the technical components behind the the technical components behind the tests, um, where the actual strand areas are mapped out to content, so you can see like the different level of um, uh, items that are included on the test. 
I don't know that uh, specifically, but I know we do have it in the document on our website. What type of uh, what type of uh, constructs are being measured, and then that's where it would map to whether or not it needed a calculator or what type of calculator. Okay, great, awesome. And then also from Giovanna, is there any way to make the tutorial computer adaptive? It's not helpful for students to use the tutorial more than once when the questions are static. Unfortunately not. Um, it's like uh, most test type materials, but I have put a uh, request in to maybe get maybe two or three different versions of the uh, test, the, um, the practice app. So the questions in the practice app, as well as the um, sample test questions. So there's a variety of resources that are different. So you got the practice app, you got the questions in the PAA, and then you have the um, the sample test questions. So I would encourage you for now to use uh, all three of those to um, ensure like if a student wanted uh, additional additional practice questions, there are those variety of resources. And then from um, San Juanita, we have how long is the PAA in AccuPlacer? When we designed the pre-assessment activity, it was with the intent that it would take the students no more than uh, 20 minutes to complete. However, it's subjective to how long it takes the students to actually complete the practice test questions because the, the practice test questions uh, or the sample questions that the students must engage in are designed kind of like in the platform of the TSI-2 and the student must go through um, each essentially each of the practice tests. And I, and I don't wanna say practice tests because I don't want you to tell students to go in the practice app and click practice tests. That's something different. But within the PAA, there are sample questions the student must engage in. And it's just determining how long, it's um, determined on how long it takes the students to get through those uh, practice questions really is how long it would take the student to complete the PAA. But again, at original design, it was, okay, it's 10 questions per, per uh, subject area for 10 questions for English language arts and reading, 10 questions for math that um, it would generally take the students about uh, 20 minutes to complete. And will there be, this is from Elijah, will there be more release questions or full tests for practice anytime soon? No, unfortunately with the design of the, the computer adaptive nature of the test, item exposure and uh, item redevelopment is a, um, is a, the design of the test is to where we don't have to consistently redesign the questions. And that's one of the uh, primary reasons it is computer adaptive to reduce item exposure. And uh, we don't release full tests to keep the cost of the tests down. As you're aware with STAR, with that requiring of the release of full tests, that requires the full item bank to be redeveloped, which drastically drives up the cost of administration for the assessment. So uh, with regard to uh, my response to the previous question about the um, static questions in the, I believe it was like the tutorial or the PAA, uh, I have requested, okay, can we get like a couple of this, like an A, B, and C set? But I don't think it, uh, if that's granted, I don't think it would be anything beyond, beyond that. But I also encourage you a number of institutions across the state have done a phenomenal job with curating uh, test prep materials for the TSIA and for the TSIA-2. If you just Google TSIA-2 uh, test prep, you'll probably hit a number of higher ed institutions that have uh, robust resources uh, that you can pull from and have your students engage in. And I strongly encourage you to speak with your dual credit partner on what types of um, TSIA-2 prep materials they have for their students and possibly use those as well. Great. And then a couple next questions, um, if we could provide your email, which we'll definitely follow. If that's not in the chat already, we'll be able to follow up afterwards with that. And then putting the LEAR um, retesting in the chat so we can click, that will also be provided afterwards as well. 
And can, um, can students test each test separately on their first time testing? This is from Elizabeth. Yes, that is a common question I get. So when I, when I talk about splitting the test, I'm primarily talking about um, um, the student splitting the, or an institution using separate branching profiles, but for the purpose of testing, if you wanna administer the English language arts and reading on one day uh, and the student takes and completes that and then takes the math on another day, that is absolutely fine. And also just as a reminder, we do have the save and continue later feature for all sections uh, with the exception of the essay. So if a student engages in the ELAR CRC, excuse me, and let's just say they're not successful and uh, the student starts the diagnostic test and they get to question two and it's just like, hey, I'm in mental overload. The student can save and continue later and they have up to 13 days to come back and finish the test. So, and that uh, is the same for the math section. And then for the essay, you can't save and continue later. So unfortunately, if a student starts typing their essay and they hit save and continue later, when they come back to it, that's not gonna be there and they're gonna have a new prompt. So um, that's why we say it's not available for the, uh, the essay. However, they can stop at the uh, onset of the essay, take a break um, and then come back, but just know that it would be a different prompt. Great, thank you. So um, a question from Brian is, will the Partners in Success Conference address preparation content at all? We will, we'll talk a little bit more about our, um, our TSI2 learning resources in advance. We don't uh, partner with third party companies or uh, make recommendations for such, because I know I see someone drop in like the edready.org. Uh, um, there are a number of uh, resources that are out there, but uh, just in our position outside of the curated resources and the TSI2 learning resources and those that have been curated by the test vendor, the college board, um, in the space of the pre-assessment activity, the sample, the sample tests, um, the sample questions packet packets, and the practice app, uh, those are the official um, resources that we would endorse. But there are a variety out there. Okay, great. And we have three more questions currently, so we're going to go ahead and answer these and then start wrapping it up. We only have a and couple real minutes. quick. There was one. There was one in the chat that I want to make sure I address, and it was regarding can ESOL students use a dictionary during the administration of the TSI two? And the answer is no. Yes, can emergent bilinguals use dictionaries on the TSI two? And the answer is no. Yes, and we'll go back through the chat as well okay. and answer any of those questions um, with our follow-up email because I you guys have a lot of questions and they're all great, but I want to just be respectful of everyone's time as well. So um, we've got a couple more here and then um, we will definitely get back to you and you can reach out to Keelan at any time or anyone on our staff as well. So from San um, Juanita, we have, based on what you just covered, I believe I have the answer, but I have a scenario. A student took the essay retest only, but didn't take the ELAR prior to the retest. If he takes the ELAR now, will the writing score he earned be valid, or be invalid, I'm sorry. Is that score valid now since it was the retest only, but he never really took the test? I'm new to my position and this happened prior to my time. I With called them. the AccuPlacer and they said that the score is valid, but what I understand from your presentation, I'm understanding the score would be invalid. Correct. Now, when the AccuPlacer is responding, they're saying, Do, does the student have a valid score? In actuality, the answer is yes. What happens is when it's presented to the institution for the purpose of dual credit or placement, it would be acknowledged as uh, inconsistent with test administration protocols and therefore would not be able to be used uh, based on the guidance that we've provided to institutions. But honestly, um, if I get a call from an institution and this is the situation, I mean, I'm just gonna be transparent with you. I honestly do not allow students to get caught in the crosshairs. I'll, I'll often make that concession. However, it's with that notion that it's a one-off. 
But if it happens again and it's with the same uh, test administrator, with the same test administrator, it raises my eyebrow a little bit, and then the conversation changes, and then we're reaching out to that test administrator. So we don't want uh, situations where test administrators are intentionally uh, trying to circumvent the system. But uh, I do my best not to have students bear the consequences of um, things beyond their control, particularly in the space of test administration. But the answer to the question is definitely the score would be invalid, but someone would have to reach out to me to explain the situation. And then I would go ahead and give that stamp of approval. Thank you. And then from Wendy, can accommodations be requested for TSI and how are they requested through the college board? No, so accommodations, there are a number of accommodations already built into the platform. Uh, we have the, um, the, the calculator tool, we have the highlighter feature, we have the save and continue later feature, we have, um, it's an untimed test. Anything beyond those accommodations already built into the platform, you must partner with, you work with your Office of Disability Services at your dual credit partner. So at your local institution of higher education, and they'll work with you to determine the um, appropriate accommodations. And that's because um, the governance for accommodations are different for K-12 uh, than higher education. And since the, this is a test for higher education, it would fall under the purview of institutions of higher education. But if you need more information on that, uh, definitely um, shoot me a direct email. All right, and we are gonna do a couple more came in. Any best practices for retesting students? Some students continue to retake the test every time it is offered. For us, that's weekly. Uh, we've tried having them submit proof of taking practice exams, but those are the same questions. With regard to best practices for retesting, our um, spot on, our recommendation is that the student engages in some type of um, tutorial or practice prior to reattempting the test. Um, Outside of that, I would say if you have like some mandatory, if tutoring is offered where um, they can, you can, I would say in a better way, justify that or uh, confirm that they participated in some type of intervention prior to retesting. And then definitely as a uh, test administrator, in this particular space, whereas the student can take the test, retest at any time, if the district is paying for it, you can set the limit like, okay, well, you're not gonna be able to retest for another two weeks, or we want you to uh, have some additional engagement in your college algebra class prior to retesting for a month before you retest it. You have the ability to set that if the district is paying for it. But again, uh, at its very core, um, as to any student engaging with the TSI 2 a student can retest at any time, but um, you can determine whether you're going to use district testing units to pay for it or not, and what that duration looks like, if indeed you are. Thank you. And Nancy just um, had a clarifying question. Can you save and continue later if they don't start typing the essay, just a different prompt? Um, going Either back way it goes. If they start the essay and save and continue later, whether they type one word or no words, when they come back, it's going to be a different prompt. Okay. And so if a student takes the TSI at the end of eighth grade, would it still apply for senior year? Or is there a limit on how young they can take it? Um, in theory, we don't recommend students at the eighth grade level taking it. I know we have uh, the mandates for early college high schools, PTEC, um, et cetera for those in early college high schools that they're required to test. However, outside of like those few instances, we don't recommend it. And it's only because the student has not been exposed to the content in which is gonna be covered on the assessment. However, as a reminder, uh, scores are good five years from date of testing. So if a student did take, and let's just say they were successful um, in the eighth grade, those scores will be good five years uh, from date of testing. Thank you, Keelan. And those are all of our questions that we have from the Q&A. And I know there's some others that were in the chat. So we'll make sure to 
address those in our follow-up email. And so we're just going to wrap this up. Thank you guys for staying over time, those of you that were able to. Um, our next monthly webinar will be held February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day. And we'll be covering college and career readiness curriculum updates. So we're excited to share with you that the college and career readiness curriculum has had a refresh. And we hope that you're able to join us um, during our webinar to discover helpful college and career advising lessons from Texas Encores. Our staff will highlight the changes and updates to the curriculum and spotlight our academy learning areas that support your work in middle and high schools. So make sure to mark your calendars for that. And again, um, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. We currently have 100, and, no, sorry, 814 subscribers. You could be 815. Um, and then if you just don't mind taking a quick moment, I know we're over time, um, just using this QR code to provide us some feedback. Um, we really uh, appreciate your feedback and are continuously working on improving our webinar series to provide you the most up-to-date and relevant information. Um, and as I mentioned, I will be sending out all of the webinar materials later this week, and we look forward to collaborating with you all again at our February webinar. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And again, we will be including the recording um, as well as all of our contact information, as well as our slide deck. So rest assured, you will be getting all of that information. Thank you so much for joining us today.